So we began with this one. I'm going to presence this one again. Holy Mini with chosen Ewaka Wopila, Ahiehe, Ahiehe, Ahiehe. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for all that you are. We can't even know everything that you are. You're one of our highest elders. And thank you for the way that you bind all living things together as one family, the family of life. Also want to say thank you for the way that you connect us through time. Every single one of our ancestors in this room all had a drink of this very water. It's always been the same water. And all the ways of knowing and being, all of our ancestors who face similar time that we're facing right now, um, all their ceremony, all their prayer, they prayed into this water and it's here with us. It's here with us. May this water continue on its journey uh, to the generations that are coming forward, to the ancestors to come, as we say. So I just want to say, Wopila. So after all these days, um, I'm feeling like really what, where we are in our, <laughs> in our journey is we're on vision quest. Um, we're, you know, in, in the Lakota way, it's a very specific ceremony, and, we, and the word means that we're crying for a vision. That means that we, we submit ourselves in deepest humility to call upon the higher guidance that is available to us from earth, from spirit, um, from, from all dimensions, from all times, from our lineage and the lineage that's ahead of us. Um, and we present ourselves and we say, tell me what I need to know. And tell me how I can be of service. Tell me, tell me how to move forward. And so there was a song that was given to me uh, directly from Spirit um, in that way. And I'm, I want to sing that for us here. Hayah, 
we haya huero heyo. Tatanka oyatewa wa uero heyo. Tatanka oyatewa ho makia ye heyo. Tatanka oyatewa pila hamayelo heyo. We ha yo e ha ya, we ha ya he ya huero e yo. We ha yo e ha ya, we ha ya huero he yo. We ha yo e ha ya, we ha ya huero he he yo. Tonka shila ha makia ye. So in the great gift that Creator sent to me, which was the Lakota way of spiritual way, spiritual view, spiritual way of life, spiritual practice, spiritual endowment, um, it's so amazingly wise in about a million different ways. But one of the ways that I'm really noticing its wisdom is that it has ways of purposely bringing us to the very end of our own knowing and our own, the end of our own resource. It's a practice. Now in modern world, we are trained to believe that we are supposed to know <laughs> and you are supposed to be in control. as fictitious as that is for us over and over and over again. <laughs> and yet that's the pressure, right? And so what I, you know, in, in our spiritual practice, we fast. So we'll fast for four days. We'll fast with no food and no water. That's how we, that's actually how we go about this, this very humble crying for a vision in our lives. And there are other ceremonies that we do that are a little bit more physical than, than sitting on the earth also for four days without food and without water. And, and there's, it's actually humanly impossible. It cannot be done through will alone, through human strength alone. And so it's a practice that brings us right to that threshold where we have to meet our frailty, where we have to meet our limitation. Even the wisest elder among us is going to find that place quite quickly. And so when we, when we come to that place, there's, there's some pretty deep suffering that can occur. Until what we've been calling out for in unison with the support of all of our families and relatives and friends until what we've been calling out for comes to meet us. And when that comes to meet us, we are lifted. Present day, present time, present consciousness, as conscious as you can be in that situation. And suddenly you are held and you are lifted and you leave your own resource and enter into the vast greater resource. 
And that's what carries you through. Because it is a solemn commitment to complete these four days. It's the deepest of spiritual vows for us. So to place yourself over and over again in that position of knowing you will meet that place. So humbling. And I can't say that you know, you know every time that that one is going to come and meet you. There's, for me, anyway, there's always a question. Is this going to be the time when I fall and I can't get back up again? Is this going to be it? And so far, the answer has been no. Not today. Not this time and I get lifted back up on my feet somehow, some way. And I'm helped to, to finish with my relatives who are also a part of holding each other up, who are also going through their own spiritual transformation of meeting that place, letting this one be <laughs> subdued long enough to reach out and to have all of this spiritual help come flooding in and literally lift your legs over and over again. Maybe for only one day, maybe it's only the fourth day, maybe it's the third and fourth day, sometimes it's the second, third and fourth day. And we go into a an actual uh, container of this energy. And when you're in there, after that has occurred, it's like flying. It's a spiritual euphoria. But you could only be in there for a couple of hours before you have to come out and rest again. And every time you come out and rest again, and you lay down with all your exhausted, <laughs> wonderful relatives, the pain of your physical human body and experience comes back again. And so on some level, you have to go through that process every single time you head back out. This is very sacred knowledge, but I'm speaking it here as a way of expressing how I see where we are headed we may come to the end of our knowing. In fact, I think it is guaranteed we will come to the end of our knowing. The elders that I trust, because they can determine what the weather is gonna be for the next two weeks by watching the way the raven flies. They said we had 10 years to make a radical new collective decision. And that was five years ago. So I don't know about this decades business. We don't know. Let's face it, we don't know. But what I wanna to propose to us is this. Not knowing is not the same as the end of the world. <laughs> not knowing is not the same as the end of the world. Not knowing and coming to the end of our own resource might be the most powerful thing that has ever happened to us. Not knowing and coming to the end of our own resource might turn out to be the most beautiful time of our life. And part of the way that can happen is by calling upon whatever that faith is that you have, the ethics that it speaks to about how we treat each other and how we treat ourselves in that moment. Let that be our guide. Let that be our guide. We are beloved. You are beloved. You are the beautiful, beloved, celebrated, nurtured, nourished, 
precious child of creator, of creation, of the holy people, of this mother earth, of all of our relations, flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, they're rooting for us. So the last piece of that community is who? (laughs) It's us. How can we make each other the beautiful, beloved, celebrated, nurtured, nourished, beloved brother and sister that we witness in each other? In all the deep questions that arise, in all that we are asked to bring forth, in all that we are asked to relinquish, and we will be asked to relinquish that which we may have been taught we must never relinquish, for our own personal well-being. Your retirement may not come in cash. In fact, I'm going to guess it's not going to. That's okay. Let your retirement be your community. Let your retirement be your connection to younger generations. As one of the elders says, this can be a beautiful time. I was told that all of us were sent here with spiritual help swarming around us. And it can do nothing for us until we ask, because that's the law. So together with all of us, and in this, in this room and beyond, whoever's watching, And in the days that come after we leave here, let's ask. Let's ask. Let's see what love will come to meet us in this hour of our not knowing. and your words echo in all of our hearts, I hope. Um, I'm very moved by the lesson you've given us to, to correct an image that's been imposed upon Native peoples for so long, crying for a vision, and the imaging of crying at the end, the trail of tears, the end of uh, the journey, you know, the sense of a, a failed people, a failed uh, civilization or whatnot, that you're uh, leading us into an understanding of crying for vision just wipes that off the table. Because what you've given us is a sense of the uh, taking responsibility and the trial and the, re- the, the, the difficulty of taking that responsibility. I wanted to just cast it this way. Early on when we began, I asked Mary Evelyn about dream, and I know in all these traditions, especially native traditions, dreams are their own revelatory capacity, but can you hear where she's taken us? Crying for vision is different. You're taking hold of yourself and bringing yourself into this place, and it, uh, it opens up a knowing. It opens up a new way of knowing that's generated by a self-commitment, this crying for a vision, humble cheapi, really opening oneself for a vision. So I, I wanted to just ask you a bit more about this, what opens, what, what that knowing is that's so deeply sensory, it's so deeply emotional, and yet it has the character of knowing, what we call reason, but reason falls so short. It's a, it's a knowing of the heart in what you've presented to us. That's a very hard thing to describe. (laughs) Um, So this brings up something that I've been thinking about over the days, which is that, um, you know, even in in my culture, and I think in other cultures, this idea of, uh, or this, this way of conceptualizing these events. So the old people say, They'd be, they wouldn't even let you get that far, right? They'd be like, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, because, because there is, you know, as soon as everything, as soon as all of that 
whatever that is, <laughs> moves up here. Uh. Um, it, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a disconnect happens and there's a, a loss of, of power actually. There's a loss of that spiritual blessing in, in some ways. And, and I feel like in all of the faith traditions, we are at a point where we, where we I'm gonna say, we, we all need, that's a big statement, we all need to go back to that place that is almost beyond words, that, we, that is within our faith. It's why our faiths have been carried forward all this time because it was such a phenomenon to our ancestors that they safeguarded it. They safeguarded that, that encounter, they safeguarded that, that, that power that, 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 that can hardly be expressed and, and conceptualized. And so once that, you know, as I talked about on my very first day, <laughs> once that academic or that, that singular way of knowing of the intellect came and, and literally was spread across the world, was imposed over humanity in every place on the planet, um, then we began to start to translate that fire, that experience, that encounter, that spontaneous combustion into c concept. Mm. And I'm noticing that even within my own culture, you know, as w you know, we have been, uh, we went through a period of being outraged of, of how anthropologists were trying to des describe us to the world when, they, when their worldview was so different that they couldn't possibly understand what they were seeing. And yet they were saying, well, these people are this, this, and this. So when we went in, we, when we came into a place, you know, our, our spiritual way of life wasn't legalized until I think it was, what, 1972, huh? Yes. Very late in the game. <laughs> um, but but when, we, when we came to that, to that, to that place and, and beyond, you know, and we started entering into the universities, um, uh, we wanted to explain ourselves to the world, but we started doing it through that academic lens. And so what I feel like, you know, even my culture is endangering, is endangering itself of, is conceptualizing what we are. And um, at that point, we begin, we begin to, to lose something so powerful. And so I'm uh, putting, putting that out there. And, and I think, you know, our, our, our spiritual way of life, I, I was going to say religion, but I'm going to edge it over just a little bit. You know, it, it's, not, it's not a written thing. So I don't know what these uh, deep religious practices do once they commit those, those very holy occurrences to paper and to the, to the written way, but I know that what caused them to be written and, and to be written on special paper and to be presented in a very special way was because of what actually happened in the spirit, in the body, in the heart, long before it ever came up to here. So I, I call on us to, to go back and find that place because it's not, you know, people will, that I'm around sometimes will joke and say, well, that's like Old Testament stuff, right? That used to happen back then. No, 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 no. It's alive here. It's always been alive here. And it's alive right now. Mm. Oh, please. Wow. <laughs> 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 Welcome. <laughs> yes, yeah, catching up fast. So I was, um, first of all, thank you for sharing all that. There's um, a woman who's an elder and somebody I've known for 30 years, and so much she's, um, her experience of being black and Lakota and she used so much of the same language talking, you know, the idea of the great mystery and trying to get me to think about, you know, to relinquish, you know, this enough so that I, which means that I have to trust that which I cannot see, feel, define, that it's going to actually be there for me. Um, I was thinking about a couple of different things when you mentioned academia and the way that, not to demonize academia, but the idea that to intellectualize the world has been privileged as the way and the right way to understand what's going on in the world um, and how for me when I think about the way we think about difference and diversity and we say that that's what we want to bring in but yet what we were what I find is that we're actually asking it to assimilate to what already exists as opposed to making space for anything that's new um, I'm thinking of yes <laughs> I'm thinking about the idea of taking a risk in order to gain as opposed 
to taking a risk in order not to lose, which is also, for me, when I, what I, how I interpret some of what you're saying for myself is that, you know, again, how do you step into the I don't know? And some of that is about practice. Some of that is about intention. Some of that is about relationship. When you said, I couldn't believe you said the same thing as Kaylin when you said this idea that your retirement is your relationships. And she says it to me all the time. She's in her 70s. She says, my social security is my relationships. It's not about money. And that kind of blew my, when I really understood that, my fears about I'm not going to have enough to pay the rent or all of these things. But the idea, if I put my faith in my relationships, and my work there, I will be okay going into the I don't know. Sorry, you, you, there was a lot going on. I don't want to take it up, but that was deep. I think I'll start. You know, great talk, really enjoyed it. But, you know, as they say that money cannot buy everything, but I just need the opportunity to test this hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> That's... That, that aside, actually, uh, being, a, being a neuroscientist, I should really defend the brain. But when I br pulled my religious card, actually in Quran, heart is described as seat of intellect. And because it actually provides the blood to the brain, and without it, brain cannot really function at all. So the tribute is really paid to the giver, which is the source of really everything that the brain does. So when we say in, um, in Islam, Bismillah rahman rahim I begin in the name of God, you know, most merciful and beneficent. Mm. Um, rahman and Rahim in Arabic means more or less the same thing, but Rahim comes from womb of the mother. So God says the way mother nurtures and nourishes a baby without baby having any senses or the needs or desires, this is how I provide, right? And then the rest of the part is, is fatherly love. So you have to really make the effort to go up. So because heart really provides the blood to the brain, without it, it doesn't function. I think that's where we connect it at the heart level. And I think that's a lot easier because the conscious is individual to individual people and we all have different consciences. But I think heart, which is the, really the sinoatrial node, is common in all of us. So, thank you. Um, you know, Confucianism, the heart and mind are one. Yes. They're one character. So, when I left in the 60s and went to Japan to teach there. It was a great relief <laughs> because there was this integration um, where people would say, I've been thinking about this, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so I think your invitation to feel and think and cry and call, you know, in a, in a magnificent path mm -hmm. is so powerful. And I just wanted to, maybe give a shout out to what's happening here in Louisville too. You know, there's an Earth and Spirit Center that's trying to put this together. Joe Mitchell, this wonderful director. Mm. Uh, you know, that's, and that's in, been inspired by Thomas Berry and so on, because Joe's a passionist priest. Um, and there's a, another wonderful Tibetan center doing meditation. And I wanted to also just mention Lisa Miller, who's trying to help people understand as young people without this integration. And her book, The Spiritual Child, is I think very much in line with this. But I want to thank you for your presence, your integration, and that deep sense we are at a non-knowing. And that is also a great gift. So thank you for bringing us to that path. Thank you. It's wonderful to, uh, to listen to the uh, conversation on uh, cosmology and worldview. Uh, it, it's not been at 30,000 feet, has it? I, we've, uh, we danced in the story, and we had a good sense of laughter, and you nested us in all of these circles going out. and. Uh, we sang together, we sang through you. But you uh, taught, brought us to water mm -hmm. before we sang. And you brought us to water in that ancestral presence too. All of our ancestors drank from this water. It flows all around us and through us. And it's uh, in uh, Taoist tradition especially that I find that sense of water and letting go. And I feel that a lot in, in where you've brought us to the the capacity to let go is not simply a conceptual act. 
it's a it's a crying out it's so in some ways i feel so foreign to us to finally reach a, a letting go it's not we're driven creatures we're we're mammals who um fight to survive and we learn how to play and reach out but somehow it's that deep letting go which is still such a challenge and for traditions to have come to an understanding of this is uh, it's profound eh? 